Cube API Server, Cube Scheduler, CCM or KCM or etcd. These are on the master side. You have a CLI on the outside called Cube CTL, and then on each node uh, you want to have Cube Proxy, proxying of your network within parts, and then you have Kubelet, whose responsibility is to make sure the containers are live, up and running. If they go down, bring them up. So uh, same diagram, but without the workload here. Uh, these are the components we are trying to install, configure, run, make them talk to each other. Quick recap: you need to figure out what cloud provider you are or on-prem node configuration. We are going to be having a highly available cluster. Uh, how many AZs, uh, what masters in what AZs, and how many nodes per AZs, and what's the auto scaling policy. Uh, we have to figure out okay, what networking we're going to be using. We have to note down what CIDRs for the VPC for the part using, name of the cluster, the DNS entry in it, binaries for all the Kubernetes components, many TLS certificates we will need uh, for the HTTPS of API server, for the interaction between node and the master because the whole communication within the Kubernetes cluster is on TLS and then the bootstrap configuration for each of the components. So let's talk about KOps, Kubernetes operations, production grade Kubernetes installation, upgrades, management. One important thing here, KOps is only going to be talking about cluster. It's not talking about your apps. So the responsibility of KOps is only to give you and manage and upgrade your Kubernetes cluster. That means masters, the components running in masters, right? Nodes, worker nodes, and those kubelets and kube proxy components. What you run in that cluster, what applications that you run, your Nginx applications, maybe your Node.js, your Spring Boot, your databases, anything, that's not the responsibility of KOps. I just want to clarify, KOps is not kubectl. It's an opinionated provisioning system, fully automated installation, all the complexities that we have gone through, this guy will take care of it all in single command. It will use DNS to identify cluster. It's a self-healing cluster, meaning if a node goes down, it will come back up on AWS because it's setting it up using auto-scaling groups of AWS. It supports multiple operating systems, whether you are on Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, RHEL, Amazon Linux, CoreOS. It can set up your cluster in a high availability fashion as well, meaning more than one master, meaning one master per AZ, and you can have multiple AZ within the same cluster all that kind of support is available you should be running more than one master each within its own availability zone within your kubernetes cluster for your production workload it can provision and generate terraform manifest terraform templates right down the line if you want to move out of aws or alongside aws you want to support other cloud providers as well this is going to help you there terraform is going to help you there Awesome community support, I would say. Actually, that's true for everything in the Kubernetes world. They have dedicated Slack channel, and then you can see whether it's EKS, whether it's KOps, whether it's Kubernetes. Many, many channels that you can go and access. Uh, a lot of good stuff on the entire ecosystem, not just KOps or Kubernetes. And of course, it's part of the Kubernetes project. You want to make sure all the configuration that you ever do on your cluster, starting from launching a virtual machine to installing some libraries, configuring every piece of it, you want to make sure it's coded or it's part of your code. It should be committed to your repository, right? The concept of infrastructure as code. So GearOps let us adopt that principle of immutable infrastructure as well as infrastructure as code. So once you have this prerequisites, Let's move on to install it onto AWS. So let me log in into my labs account. So the first thing you need is a domain. So I have this domain, kates.init.academy, just the name server record and a SOA record, nothing more than that. And that's actually the name I want for my cluster as well. You need a user as well and create a brand new user. I'm just gonna give it a programmatic access, nothing more than that. I don't need UI access for this guy. What you need is like a role which has four different privileges, or five actually, that you need to provide to your user. So in this case, I'm just gonna go there and I'm saying, you know what, attach existing policies. I will copy one by one. So let me just configure my local AWS. So I'm just going to say AWS configure. I have the key, so let's copy the key. 
never make anything public especially the secret key default region name I want to make sure I am using US East one and then I want to have JSON output from AWS CLI that's it so what we did so far is we set up our AWS CLI locally so that from terminal we can talk to our AWS cluster or AWS account uh, for that matter so let me verify it works yep it does work I can get who I am now the first thing that care apps need from this user is create this bucket I'm naming it naming the bucket with the same name as my cluster and calling it state store I'm gonna create it in the US East uh, Northern Virginia do that if you go and check your S3 yeah it's created there few things you can change uh, you can enable versioning of it you can actually enable encryption as well and make sure no one else has access to this bucket apart from very core people in your DevOps admin team so once that is there the next thing is we need to create this environment variable called chaos state store in the commands following to this it will need to know where is your s3 bucket right this is the name of the s3 bucket that we just created this guy so I'm just gonna execute this command to have this variable set up in this particular session of the terminal next thing is okay let's go and run this command called chaos create cluster tell what zone to create some of the nodes what is the name of the cluster and if you do this what chaos will do it will go and create the configuration required for it it's the simplest command that you can use instead of creating and applying it to the AWS account I'm just saying you know what don't apply it let's just look into what you are gonna be applying what all things you're gonna be creating and that's where I'm using dry run flag and saying you know what output it to the YAML configuration so once that is done let's see what's the default configuration that chaos will have minimalistic create cluster command let's see what configuration it's trying to put where is the output starting okay so it looks like a YAML file with a type of cluster the name is what we said then it has the API GNS configuration there enable RBAC uh, this is for the security whenever you want to talk to API server you need to present authorized certificates so that's where RBAC is by default enabled for you there are stable and an edge channel edge is where all nightly builds are going so we want to use stable one of course our cloud provider is AWS remember in in case of Kubernetes when we started we talked about this guy CCM how would Keops know what to install whether AWS specific CCM or Azure specific or Google Cloud so that's where we are saying deploy CCM specific to AWS uh, where is your configuration then where should I create my HCD cluster then with the IAM AWS has something called elastic container registry it's like a private docker registry for for your AWS account by default it's enabled if you want to uh, use it where from where do you want to access Kubernetes API I'm saying yeah make it public keep it open everyone can reach it from outside the VPC as well so that's why it is now I want to install Kubernetes version 1.10 specifically what is the domain of API server API dot your cluster name what should be the VPC CIDR KOPS is taking all these decisions on its own we don't have to worry about all the pieces what networking are you gonna be using so by default it's gonna be using kubenet which has a limitation from AWS in a routing table in AWS you can only have 50 routes so that's a limitation now for parts what should be the IP addresses range that you want to use KOPS has already took that decision this is private IP address range anyways it's a very huge range if you see slash 10 uh, whether you want to be having an SSH access if you want to have SSH access to this cluster from where you should be able to do it I'm saying yeah from all over the world you should be allowing it of course in an ideal hardened cluster all those things will be limited to your VPN or your private uh, network uh, it will create subnets in this case in one uh, US is 1a it will make all the nodes whether those are type of worker as well as master in the public subnets not something that you would want so DNS means all the load balancer will be in the public and then the masters and nodes will also be in the public then it has a couple of more configuration one for the master then here one node which is of very small capability t2 medium two nodes actually uh, max size and mean size so that's pretty much the default configuration and I'm like 
I don't like it. I want to change a few things there. I want to make some customizations, right? That's the whole point of using KOps. Otherwise, we could have gone easily with EKS. So let's go into the next one, which is a little complex. Here I'm saying, okay, this is my DNS. Fine, this is my zone. I want to use M5 large type of EC2 instance. I want one of it. I want two nodes of M5 large as well. So I am controlling it now. For the networking, I'm going to be using Cube Router. Pretty, pretty powerful routing plugin coming from uh, Cloud Native Labs. But then make sure my masters and nodes are in the private subnets. They are not exposed to the outside world, right? Pretty good. Also, since these are in the private VPC, I want to have a bastion or jump box in order to reach to my VPC, in order to SSH. And then the name is as it is. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run this and then understand, okay, what type of configuration it gives me. Again, in this case as well, this was a single master, not highly available, right? This is a single master. So here, what you see is you have same stuff. Load balancer will be in the public, fine, or back. Same stuff, same thing here as well, nothing changes. Uh, same CIDR for the VPC, uh, same CIDR for the parts and services. So in this case, I said I need to have my master nodes and the worker nodes in the private subnet so it has created a private subnet but for the bastion and the public load balancers you it will create a utility which is a public subnet as well uh, it will figure out okay you your bastion name or the dns will be this it will internally create a route 53 entry as well and then you can see the difference here your masters and nodes are in the private while your load balancers and dns are in the public right you can change those pieces as well again same thing instance group you have one master, two nodes, and this time one bastion as well, which is just the jump box, nothing more than that. And you're like, fine, pretty good. Uh, one thing here, in this case, still, the API server is exposed to the world. You may not want it. In a production-ready, hardened cluster, you would want to block it, or you want to allow access to the API server only from within your VPN or your private network of your office. The third configuration that I want to see is you know what one master doesn't work for me I want to have multi master and I want to make sure one master in one availability zone and I want three availability zones each having one master I want two nodes worker nodes in each availability zone so I want my entire cluster very highly available in this case I want three zones to be targeting, 1A, 1B, and 1C in US East 1 region. I want three masters of the type M5 large. I want six nodes of the type M5 large. I want to use same setup as before. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to just output all this to a YAML file, which I can commit it to my Git repository as well, right? So, so what do I have here? Hmm. Uh, same stuff, nothing changes, load balancer is public, fine, this is my store. Things have changed here. Now you will have three HCD cluster in each availability zone, 1A, 1B, 1C. If one goes down, two, two other will be available there, right? And then one will come back again. Kubernetes API access is still public. You can make it private as well and limit it to from a certain CIDR. Networking is fine, all good. Now you see how many subnets have been created here. 1a 1b 1c these are three private subnets which have been created to host your master nodes and your worker nodes then you have three utility subnets which are public facing subnets for your load balancer for your bastion bastion name is this the rest of the stuff same now you will have more instance scripts configuration for your instances right uh, one master in 1a with this particular image uh, 1b will have one master 1c will have one master and then you will have six nodes uh, across three different availability zones. These are worker nodes. You know, it will distribute two in each. And then you have one bastion here. Now, once you have it, you can just go and say, instead of creating from this complex command that we used before, if you have it in a YAML file, you can just use create f flag and then just say cluster.yaml. That's, that's the whole concept behind infrastructure as code, right? It's configuration that you are saving with your uh, version control. One thing that I want to change here is since I'm using M5 large instance, there is a change in the networking the way it used to work in M4 large, an old generation of the same capacity EC2 node, versus this M5 large, 
this particular image doesn't work. There's a new version for that particular type of load that I'm changing here. So I'm gonna change it to master. This one is uh, gonna understand the new configuration of networking on M5 type of, uh, which is which only came this year actually. So there was a change in the AMI for it. I'm just going to press all over. It's a new version of Debian actually. So once you commit and your configuration, you have access to a lot of good stuff here. Cool. So once that is done, all the configuration is there. The only thing that you have to do is go and hit this command and just grab a cup of coffee. Yeah, so it has validated that all the things are good in this case. So of course, it found out you have a cluster, three different instance groups for the master, one instance group for the six nodes, and then one for the bastion as well. And then now it's saying, you know what, in order to deploy it, just run this command. So it will be like, oh, sure. Now it will complain, uh, I need your SSH keys as well. Remember, we are setting up EC2 nodes. So from this machine, if you want to talk to those or SSH into those boxes, your public key has to be copied from here to those EC2 machines, right? So I'd saying, well, create a secret if your key is available at this place, uh, your uh, SSH keys, if those are not, generate them. As soon as I create this secret, KeyOps will use that public key now, and then if you run update cluster next time, it will use that public key that you have on your machine and copy them to all the our EC2 instances that it's gonna create. And you can see, it's just doing all those things automatically. It's first of all issuing all the certificates. Remember, one of the things that you needed in Kubernetes setup is generate all those certificates, right? Uh, that's what it's doing. Then it's creating the instance profile, which is an auto scaling group target group. Then it's creating the network gateway. You can start refreshing on here. Yep, you can see these things are coming up on your VPC. You have a brand new VPC now. You have subnets created as well, all of them. You have routing table created and getting configured for private subnets and a public one as well you have internet gateway was created for you elastic ip was scheduled for you and then that gateway will be created if you go back to ec2 you will have volumes getting created for your etcd volumes remember right or all the masters all those pieces and the nodes you will have proper security groups getting created for you load balances are getting created for you behind the scene right so it will take few minutes this is the first time it's booting up entire cluster it says, well, cluster is starting. It should be ready in a few minutes. Uh, there is a command to validate the cluster. And it will take some time because the API load balancer may not be up by this time. So Bastion is, 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 is ready. API server is still booting it up. It takes some time around it. Uh, let's go and check Route 53 as well because some entries have already been created by KeyOps for you. You see, there were only two before, now you have all these entries about where are your etcd cluster, how you can reach to the API from outside or inside the cluster, and how do you reach Bastion as well. Ah yeah, uh, so it's, at least API server is now responding. Yep, all three masters are available or you can reach out. Uh, there are a few still nodes which are which have not yet joined to the cluster. So they are in the process of joining, but all the masters are already there. Maybe these nodes are lazy or having some time. Okay, cool. Then some, it's not really some pod, internal pod for the cube system. Uh, cube router is not uh, healthy there. So it, it, it's gonna take some time. So that's it. That's how you actually set up your Kubernetes cluster using KeyOps.